Great. Welcome to the fifth episode of Identity International's webinar series, Kashmiri Before Beyond Conflict. This series will be running throughout the month of October, every Thursday and Saturday at 5 p.m. British summertime, where we will be delving into the complexities of Kashmiri identity with our esteemed guests. To receive notifications and updates regarding the series, please follow our social media platforms and or register on our Eventbrite page by searching Kashmiri Beyond Conflict. Today, we will be in conversation with Dr. Mohammed Janaid. Janaid is an assistant professor at, of anthropology at the Massachusetts College of Liberal, uh, Liberal Arts. He has a PhD from the City University of New York with research on violence, nationalism, culture, and politics in South Asia. He has written extensively on military occupation, history, space, and resistance in Kashmir, where he also grew up. He has contributed essays on Kashmir in several edited volumes, including the most recent, the Price of Blood, State, um, state Precarity, and the Moral Discourse of Loyalty, in Canada, which was published in the journal Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and Middle East. His essays have also appeared in Economic and Political Weekly, Greater Kashmir, Tankid, uh, al Jazeera, and TRT. Janaid, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. We'll start with a question that we've asked all our guests so far. And it's a very broad question. You can take it in any direction that you wish. And it's sort of, what does it personally mean to you to be Um, Thank you. Uh, that's a very complex um, question to unpack. Um, for me, um, from an ethical perspective, because I take a very ethical perspective on, on the question of Kashmir, um, it is not necessarily, to me, a, a question of um, ethnicity. It's not a question of language. It's not uh, a question of having pride. Um, although we are, as Kashmiris, uh, like others, um, uh, we respect our homeland, we respect our history, um, and we look back at our history and um, uh, we're conscious of it. Um, because we know what has been going on. Um, some of this history is something that one can be proud of. Uh, when we like welcome people from outside who escaped, for instance, uh, repression in their own lands and became refugees in our, in our country. Um, and we, I'm proud of those moments. Um, I'm not proud of moments where our leaders compromised on basic um, questions of our freedom. Um, but so to me, if one has to ask what Kashmiri means to me, it's primarily now become a political identity. Uh, and I say it uh, very deliberately uh, political because uh, politics to me um, at this stage means um, to raise questions that of, of justice, uh, to, question, to raise questions of justice in Kashmir uh, and by being Kashmiri recognize the the, these issues of injustice that are happening all around the world, be it Palestine, um, you know, or any other region in the world, uh, for that matter, Central South America, um, and or Rohingyas, or even in within India, you know, the the Adivasis, the Dalits, um, uh, and in our you know other uh, in the broader region of South Asia. So it has now become a political identity um, uh, for me um, and. If if you are Kashmiri and you're not cognizant and conscious of, um, of the, these problems of injustice around the world, then um, I would think that you, you're, you're really not tuned in um, to your specific situation as a Kashmiri. Now, that's interesting. I mean, I find like, you know, the way that you've sort of related it to other minority groups and that have been suppressed and counting Kashmiris in that group itself, it says a lot about what you sort of stand for because of the othering that you might face as well. Have you faced any othering? At, like, you know, when you've been in like either India occupied Kashmir or Pakistan side or even in the States, you know, if you've come across other sort of uh, groups, how has that felt? Um, it, again, you know, I mean, one is always located or situated in specific um, uh, social political configurations. Where I grew up in Kashmir, you know, I was born in South Kashmir and in a uh, town called Islamabad, also known as Anantanag. Um, and 
there in the beginning i you know when we used to go to school we used to see soldiers on the streets um, um of course there was like a lot of tension around there was this war of liberation going on in the 90s and um we were very conscious of the fact that we were an occupied people you know we didn't have political rights we didn't have civil rights so we could be um we were subject to um brutal treatment we knew uh for instance um that they could kill us and uh, nobody is going to go to jail for that you know or the soldiers could come into our homes and uh disarrange everything um harass women um assault our men uh older people you know uh we we were very conscious of that but one thing that i was um it took me a time to recognize was that there was some comfort in knowing that i was part of a larger community you know where the question of identity was not primary you know we were only made conscious of our identity by the presence of indian soldiers um so there were other issues that for instance i grew up uh, recognizing um for instance you know why uh, kashmiri society had to be patriarchal i mean i later recognized that it was uh, we were not alone in this sin um, there were other community you know societies just like that um we i grew conscious of um for instance uh, uh some of the weaker such se sections classes in our society uh who were socio economically had been left behind uh for instance um the the community of of watals uh which is like this uh undercaste community historically oppressed uh in kashmir and it, i became conscious of it because i used to walk to my school through a neighborhood uh, which was primarily uh, of um uh, the made up of watal community uh sheikh community also known as uh, sheikh community um and watal was like uh, in a way a pejorative term uh, i just want to make sure that you recognize that it was a pejorative term that people used to use at that time and i grew conscious of these issues at that time i wasn't so conscious of my own identity um later on i went i left kashmir and I went to this um indian university called aligarh muslim university where um i was a uh, kashmiri in a larger muslim community you know and i became conscious of my kashmiriness at that time not my religious identity but my ethnic identity because um fellow kashmiri uh, students who were there we were a small minority and we were surrounded by uh, a larger muslim community in aligarh indian muslims uh, who had a very different perspective on india they were quite nationalistic and of course we were not um they kind of sometimes shut us down we would tell them like things are really bad in kashmir and they would they couldn't recognize it some of them could but not most of them later on i went to jnu jawaharlal nehru university in delhi uh, i spent several years there four years for and four five years there and i suddenly became aware of both my um original kashmiri national identity but also my religious identity because for the first time i was living in a space which was majority indian hindu as well as indian nationalist so um, and i also came in touch with people from other places all around the world um and so the sense of identity kind of grew and later on i came to the us for my phd um i mean one couldn't i mean i was already aware of the questions of empire and imperialism the history of colonization racism around the world but you know i just like became aware of my own brownness as well you know um um that not only was a, a kashmiri a muslim but also a brown man in a primarily white america um so you know these things kind of um awareness of this caste discriminations in kashmir of course it i began to see why things were happening in kashmir because we were um historically linked to this broader region of central and south asia um questions of gender questions of religious and ethnic identity and questions of racial uh, formations that kind of um you know made us who we were and told me what you know uh, allowed me to uh, uh, explain uh, and understand my experiences that's very interesting especially like the different experiences that you've had with different forms aspects of your identity you know and 
that changing according to your environment and the situations that you've been placed in. I guess because of the different type of people you come across different as different parts or different aspects of your identity get challenged in that respect as well. Um, have you, had you think this kind of guided you as an academic or has influenced how you sort of, um, you know, evolved as an academic throughout the years? Um, so I actually, <laughs> it's um, the choice of what we choose, you know, uh, study, the choice of our career um, is partly determined by, you know, um, how, where we grew up, what our aspirations are. Uh, for instance, uh, like, for instance, if I had grown up in a uh, Indian middle class Hindu um, background, perhaps my aspirations would have been um, to go to, into other fields, like, you know, um, choose a career different from what I have now. Um, but the experience of growing as minority in these all these different levels that I just explained um, made me realize that uh, at the forefront of my research has to be uh, questions of justice and equality. And um, I started actually by, um, you know, trying to become a journal, journalist. Uh, many of my friends at that time in Kashmir were becoming journalists and I was excited about the idea. Um, uh, yet um, I went in a different direction. I, in JNU, I studied international politics. Uh, and, and again, I just realized that perhaps this international politics with its so much focus on states as actors, uh, on the game theory, on war and, you know, questions like that. Um, it's mostly kind of like this top-down approach to the world, you know, and um, it was better to figure out a field which kind of allowed one to look at the things ground up, you know. Um, so I chose anthropology. Anthropology was a natural home for the kind of ideas and experiences I had, you know, especially it's focus on ethnography, uh, I could go back to Kashmir and um, things that I had, had I had missed, you know, when we're all kind of like in a fish in a pond, if we, you know, if we don't go out, um, yeah. we probably think that the pond is the entire world. Um, so for me to and return to Kashmir with this anthropological perspective was a uh, was an important step to understand like what was not not only my own experiences because I was insignificant in the larger thing that was Kashmir. Uh, I just wanted to understand why our experiences as Kashmiris were were the ones that they were. You know what had been what had happened to us historically, what had happened to our society, what had uh, why were aspirations the way they were. Uh, what is this idea of freedom that we were talking about? I mean, I was committed to this idea, but I wanted to understand fuller, better that that this idea did not come from some empty place. You know that that there was a history behind it. Were there but, any like I mean, you, when you returned to Kashmir with this anthropological lens and society around you, were there any interesting conclusions that you must have come across? And does that change every time you go back? As you. Yes, um, I mean, first thing you do um, uh, when you, um, not only in anthropology, but if you are a committed scholar um, interested in understanding um, people's perspective, um, uh, dispassionately understanding the history of a place, um, I think what you do is, um, first of all, you read everything that has been written about a particular uh, people, a particular subject. Um, you understand all these different perspectives. You try to kind of create a map of knowledge uh, that has been created um, by a previous scholarship. And then, you know, um, you try to see well, how uh, people talk in Kashmir, uh, locate their experiences and try to relate it with what you have read. And does, is there, is there a correlation, a correspondence, or is there a, a lot of dissonance? Is this, there's some kind of a gap, you know? And what I realized is that a lot of things that had been written on Kashmir, primarily by non-Kashmiris, um, yeah. both scholars, journalists, um, people from the British, uh, you know, colonial travelers and tourists to the Indian Indians 
from secular and nationalist perspectives to later on Americans and uh, other European travelers in Kashmir, whatever had been written uh, seemed to have this basic disconnect with our own experiences. You know, um, I we had to. I realized that uh, what we need is uh, that we need people in. Uh, doing scholarship on Kashmir, who are actually uh, interested in uh, the in, in this issue in 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 the in Kashmiri art, culture, politics from a Kashmiri perspective. You know, locate our understanding of it. And ethnography, that's what ethnography does. You know, you don't impose your vision on a society. You know, you don't use terms from outside. Uh, the society that you are understanding, but you locate um, the, the frames of understanding from within that society um, to make make sense of it. And that's what I mean. My colleagues uh, who are anthropologists, both Kashmiri and non-Kashmiri, including Indian anthropologists now who are like committed to this vision, that's what they are trying to do. You know, uh, create a new knowledge about Kashmir, um, not only for us but for the rest of the world because uh, we need to understand ourselves. Kashmiris need to understand ourselves and people outside who are interested in us must understand uh, us um, with a more uh, clearer, authentic uh, perspective rather than something that uh, serves the purposes of one nation state or the other. Yeah. Well, imposing their sort of image of Kashmir on top of Kashmiris and trying to prove that image rather than giving the Kashmiri people their own you know, voice is what I get a lot of from a lot of the literature, even the news articles I read you know, um, about Kashmiris. Uh, most of the time is people trying to fulfill their sort of, I mean, propaganda or their objectives or their perceptions of Kashmir, which can, I think it's sort of, it's dampened the Kashmiri voice a lot. You don't really get what do Kashmiris want out of this. Even though that question is a very complex question and you probably have a lot of answers to it. Um, on a more sort of cultural, kind of um, from a more cultural and gross perspective, what would, like, you know, what aspects of Kashmiri culture do you most identify with or remember fond memories of your time in Kashmir that you would like people from the outside to sort of, you know, uh, see Kashmir as? Um, well, first of all, you know, uh, Kashmiris are just like any other people, right? I mean, we're not special. <laughs> um, we're not less than others, but we're not better than others. So we have our flaws. Um, we have many flaws. I mean, um, I'm, I get obsessed with more of our flaws than what our strengths are. You know, um, it, it is better to kind of like um, be aware of what our problems are. And um, if um, I mean, in our culture, we have some real issues, you know, and uh, this um, unspoken aspect of caste in our society um, and how our communities have been pigeonholed into uh, certain stereotypes. It's a big problem. I mean, it does not, uh, I think like, you know, I've met so many uh, people from uh, those shunned castes who are unable to achieve their potential because um, their their parents, their aspiration, this the larger society around them um, does not allow them to aspire fully. You know, uh, um, I'm I'm uh, I'm uh, worried about, for instance, women in Kashmir. Um, it's not perhaps so much from the these um, upper class uh, communities so much, but uh, communities who are uh, women in um, um, lower income groups who are unable to uh, pursue their full, full potential. You know, I think that it's an important consideration. We should take that into, you know, in, into view when we think about Kashmir. Um, what warms my heart about Kashmir is about, is our hospitality. You know, um, we are um, intrinsically quite progressive. Like if we had, um, if people told us that uh, we should um, expand rights of communities, of groups of people, I think we're more inclined to say yes than to see it as a threat to us, you know, um, a, th a threat to anybody else. Like we're not essentially by nature a hierarchical society. 
um, because historically we have lived on within a hierarchy where we were the subdued um, community as um, indigenous communities uh, in in the pre modern world, pre modern Kashmir, and even in the in more modern times as um, subjects of uh, you know Dogra uh, Hindu regime. Uh, which subdued us or the later Indian occupation. I think it, what it has made us is like instinctively um, progressive, instinctively um, like uh, wanting to stand up for the rights of the oppressed. And that's amazing. I think that uh, it's a it's it's not a unique thing to us, but I think I would rather be in the in the camp that stands for the rights of others than the camp that seeks to impose hierarchy. Um, uh, I mean, of course, you know, this this question of hospitality, I mean, I take it as this broader view, not like making vazwan for people or serving tea and nunchai with a bunch of um, <sighs> baked goods. That's good. That's all fine. Uh, but uh, hospitality in this larger sense that um, our hearts are kind of open to people uh, who seek refuge and who seek shelter. And, um, and I think that that's amazing. So if... I mean, with that in mind, what do you think is the hindrance that is preventing people from, you know, the caste that you were saying in, within Kashmiri society, what is preventing them to sort of progress as well, in your opinion, at least? Uh, I mean, uh, the, the major factor has been that we have never been in charge or of a, fully uh, of our own destiny. You know, from over the last uh, few hundred years, at least, uh, um, our society has been under one or another regime that is not, uh, you know, from the region. Um, uh, always being told by outsiders how we should live our lives. It puts tremendous pressure on us. You know, it, uh, um, it puts strain on, you know, uh, our ethical perspective. It put, uh, it. Um, limits our ability to be hospitable to people. Uh, and uh, I think that it has made us uh, also fearful that about our future, whether we have a future, whether we can survive, because right now what is going on over the last, especially the last 30 years uh, under this occupation uh, is this question of survival. Can we survive as a people? And uh, all of these, you know, when you have like, bureaucrats from South India, North India, who really don't know anything about us, uh, who we don't recognize, uh, soldiers who are coming from all different parts of India, who have who should have nothing to do uh, with our lives, you know, uh, they don't belong in Kashmir, they belong in their own society. So we don't, we don't go to Punjab or Bihar to occupy their land, right? Um, I mean, it just makes it hard for us to fully be who we are you know it makes our society fearful it limits our ability to expand the rights within like over the last 30 years it has become hard to talk about questions of um, uh, hierarchy or oppression in our societies of questions questions like domestic violence questions of uh, rights of different groups of people you know within our society because we are um, we are overdetermined by this violence of the occupation and constantly think, bombarded by it, yeah constantly bombarded by violence every day and mm -hmm. i think that um it's uh, i would like to say that we have to keep those questions in mind simultaneously but i also recognize that until and unless this occupation ends we will have a very hard time you know dealing and, with yeah i can imagine i mean it's quite ambitious to try and feel so you know if there's an external threat the internal sort of needs to kind of you know you have to prioritize what you want to address as a society as well. Um, we do have a question from one of our viewers that's asking, like, how do you think the abrogation of Article 370 last year has impacted the Kashmiri identity in the region and abroad? Um, well, of course, it has uh, multiple implications. First of all, we need to understand that the, the real drive behind this abrogation was the Hindu nationalist desire to uh, annex Kashmiri land. Uh, it, the Hindu nationalist regime in India, they have for last uh, uh, 70 years tried to take away uh, 
Kashmiri land, drive Kashmiris out, uh, or turn them into some kind of a subdued minority. Um, and that's where the main impulse for this came. Um, the effect, it will have multiple effects. First of all, of course, you know, Kashmir is a recognized international dispute. It's not a, it's not a resolved problem. Uh, there is uh, there are UN resolutions um, which call for the primacy of the uh, aspiration, the the uh, will of the people of Kashmir. That's the uh, you know UN resolution forty seven that was passed in nineteen forty eight calls for uh, the that respective governments India and Pakistan to acknowledge and assess the will of the people of Kashmir, and it gets affected because India has like started this domicile project where um, they are bringing in people from outside, um, giving uh, access to land and uh, our precious resources in Kashmir to the Indian companies. Um, all of this is going to affect uh, that primary question, the, the, our right to self-determination. Um, second, and you know, with the with the dissolution, territorial dissolution of the state of Kashmir into these different regions, um, it creates more problems than it solves. Um, our uh, there are communities in these. I, I recognize, for instance, that in Ladakh there was a demand by some Buddhist groups to be integrated with India under this UN, UN, union territory provision, but not by all. You know, it's not a homogenous region. There are, um, even, even in Leh, there are um, 40, 46 person Muslims in Kargil. People find themselves closer to Kashmir uh, and to across the border with their other uh, brethren in uh, Gilgit Baltistan than with um, the some of the right wing politicians in Leh. You know, um, or the region in Jammu, which is also very heterogeneous. Jammu is not. Uh, Hindu region, you know, some districts are Hindu dominant, which have like supported BJP's agenda, but not all. I mean, there are regions of Chinab um, that want perhaps closer uh, ties with um, Kashmir or want to have their own say and not be bought down and tied down by the politicians in, in, in Hindu nationalist politicians in Jammu. So this territorial dissolution um, will opens up a Pandora's box of problems. Um, I mean, my fear is that we are going down a path where uh, if the Indian state is not stopped, if there is not adequate pressure on India, that they are going to uh, start um, this process of ethnic cleansing. Uh, they, I mean, settler colonialism is a reality now, yeah. um, but they will start this um, active ethnic cleansing across different regions of Kashmir, turning Kashmir into a space of civil war. Um, and I mean, we know from history that they have already experimented with it in 1947 in Jammu. And um, unless they're stopped, uh, you know, we are facing a very dire future. It's um, striking how much of this like, can be like you can draw parallels with, upon the Israeli and Palestinian conflict as well. You know, uh, the way that you can describe India and Kashmir is really the same way that I could probably, if you stretch out the words for like Israel and Palestine. It's almost the same where both sort of both governments are trying to create truths on the ground through private companies and coming in and taking over the land and taking over the resources. Is I mean, I would I guess if those without saying that there's probably a disconnect between the government and political um, representation, you know, uh, and the people on the ground. Uh, is there any way that you would see that we can overcome this disconnect between the two? Well, first of all, like, um, what we need to do is to recognize what the problem is right now. You know, um, I think that the question, the question that has to be kept sent you know, forward, and at the center of the debate is this question of settler colonialism. Um, Indian government um, has had this long history of like saying that they are a secular country and. Kashmir has special rights and whatnot. But we, uh, I think underneath, even the pro-India politicians all, always knew that this was, um, they're going to take it away the moment they get the first opportunity. And um, and they started this process way back in 1947. I mean, um, the occupation actually started, annex it started with annexation in 1947, and then they brought in a lot of military in 1990, turned it into a military occupation. And uh, now they are um, in this full-fledged settler colonial mode. And 
historically we're not unique in this uh, you know from america to australia to um you know the entire history of western colonialism and um, french colonialism in algeria or the present um occupations in palestine and elsewhere they all tell us they're a lesson for us right i mean that if uh we we don't we should not like forget that uh, or underestimate what it is and what it is going to do to us because the i mean i am based in the us i teach um people and i teach anthropology in some of my courses i teach um, books written by indigenous activists um you know not uh, native american activists and i read their history and i can't but um i like, fail to recognize the resonance between our experience and what they must have gone through in the long 19th and 18th century of um, european colonization uh, i mean even more than palestine i i i get seriously affected by the experiences of uh, native americans and how um there was a history of wars ethnic cleansing genocide treaty violations occupations of their land turn pushing them into reservations um and we have to recognize that we don't want our future to be that you know we don't uh, we don't want us to be erased from history and um, and that's why we just like need to recognize that settler colonialism is the most important political and ethical question in the present for us and it should be for the world as well i guess it's difficult because a lot of people might not identify it as settler colonialism considering that maybe one difference would be the fact that india isn't a european state that is drastically different from the colony that is you know like the area that is trying to colonize or the people that is trying to colonize over um it's very like, it is very interesting uh i mean we have another question it says what do you think about making the fifth state for pakistan um from pakistan um do you have any um, opinions or um i think that uh you know i mean i'm not an expert on gilgit baltistan i um, have colleagues who work on gilgit baltistan mm -hmm. uh, from their scholarship um, i realized that a lot of people in gilgit baltistan uh, feel that you know they would prefer to be a province of pakistan and because uh, by being tied down to this question of kashmir uh, they have been discriminated against um i i think that you know this is a this is a question that the people of gilgit baltistan and pakistan should um uh, kind of like address in a different way that does not affect the legality of the question of kashmir you know um is province becoming a province the only solution to their uh, problems you know um can for instance pakistan give them um, a lot more autonomy uh in within the current framework where uh, they can stay at, in this present state except that they have a lot more say in their own affairs i mean i don't personally think that having a bureaucrat from punjab or sindh lording over people in gilgit baltistan is somehow going to give them any uh, better uh, future i think that the people all the peoples of gilgit baltistan you know um should have much more autonomy much more uh, power over on their own lives they should be able to determine how they should you know whether they should double up or not you know they, it's a unique ecology you look at the uh, territory and mm -hmm. realize that how fragile that place is and they need to preserve preserve it and um i mean on the other hand i as a i wanted also tell kashmiri is that you know we shouldn't like force them to um kind of make a decision i would have like for instance uh, if 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 um, buddhists in ladakh for instance wanted to be a union territory i honestly don't think that you know it should have been an issue um as long as they were able to figure out between them whether all of the ladakh wanted to be a union territory or 
there was just some areas that wanted to be a union territory. Um, I mean, of course, you know, of course, changing the territorial status of Kashmir would uh, weak, has weakened Indian case. It, India had no case already. You know, it was just like it's it's an open violation of all international mm. laws and norms. But um, it would have weakened their case, but they would have been able to solve them. I mean, I, as a Kashmiri, I don't want to interfere in their affairs. As in the same way, I don't want to interfere in the affairs of Gilgit Baltistan. But um, I think uh, right now, um, I mean, we are at a critical stage. Um, we are undergoing in Kashmir a really huge trauma. Uh, and I mean, my request to the the brothers and sisters in Gilgit Baltistan would be to wait. They have waited for so long. Just wait more, you know, um, let this issue be resolved. Find some other um, solution that does not affect the, like the legal, legal um, you know, basis of the Kashmir dispute. Mm. Would you think, I mean, the borders, I respect, uh, they've obviously made a difference between you know, the way that Kashmir identities probably evolved throughout each side. Have you experienced that or noticed it? As in, like, you know, how you probably, I mean, it, it's come across a little bit through what you already said, but there's anything more that you could say on that? Like, as in how you sort of relate to people that are from say, the Pakistan side of Kashmir, or, you know, um, I guess, has it affected like, do you think the border itself has a huge impact on the way that the Kashmiris identify on each side of the border, because of the experiences that we have? Well, uh, the line of control, as it is called, um, mm. is uh, it's an interruption in our history. You know, it's in an interruption in our geography. It's a, a interruption in our culture. Uh, you know, before 1947, when this border was drawn, um, Kashmir had. Uh, I mean, of course, we were under a feudal autocracy, but throughout our history, our uh, kind of like subjectivity, our perspective was oriented west and north. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, our cultural ties were with this larger Persianate world. Um, our, um, you know, historic trade ties were with Central Asia um, and even to the north, uh, you know, for the north and east, uh, to Xinjiang and uh, Tibet. Um, and 1947 was an uh, interruption. We were just like forced to and violently turned around by this Indian uh, annexation and told that your only connection is to South Asia. South Asia was one of the connections that we had, but we were open to the vast, wider world. Uh, and in that sense, like, you know, I mean, if I remember like people talking about like how before 1947, when they were, when they would travel to India or the British India, they would have to go westward and via Punjab, you know, uh, there was no natural connection between um, Kashmir and India, you know, there's absolutely no natural connection. Even now they're, I mean, if you look at their projects 70 years later, they're still digging uh, tunnels into the, these mountains, uh, destroying these mountains, destroying the ecology, just to create this artificial connection uh, when there wasn't. Like our rivers didn't flow that direction. Our winds didn't flow that direction, you know. And uh, so they just like still trying to build those connections, which did not exist. And um, what it did was uh, not that we were not connected to South Asia. I don't mean to say that, you know. Um, um, we had interchange with South Asia historically, but it wasn't as intense. Um, and But what it did was, um, you know, the 1947 artificially created this division between these two Kashmirs. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that all people of this historic state of Kashmir were one, but we, we, it was a confederation of nations in a way, in a confederation of communities um, and uh, who had lived in relative harmony uh, mm -hmm. with each other. I mean, I don't think there was any conflict going on between um, different linguistic groups in Kashmir at any point. I mean, I, at least I haven't heard any, um, you know, kind of historical uh, evidence to that end. Um, and but what this does, the the occupation does, but what these creation of nation states in South Asia did was it um, politicized these identities. Um, um, I mean, you know, otherwise where they didn't exist.
It's very, very interesting. I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, are there any other sort of ending remarks that you would like to make or any other points that you would like to um, say about Kashmiri identity? Well, I mean, I think I don't think I answered your question about meeting uh, people from other side of, uh, you know, the border so well. Um, I just wanted to add that, of course, I met so many, uh, you know, uh, people, um, scholar journalists from Azad Kashmir and Good Baltistan, and of course, they're wonderful people, you know. And um, I, I, you know, it's just like uncanny experience, you know. You meet an a person from Azad Kashmir and I just feel elated actually because to see a person from other Kashmir and it's just like okay we have more people you know, we have more people somewhere <laughs> we're not just like hemmed in under this occupation between these you know mountains that beyond these hills there are more of us and um i mean um and why i talk to them and they have their problems you know i mean um they experience those problems and there's some repression there as well. Um, and I wish that wasn't the case. It, I, I sometimes fail to understand, um, you know, Pakistani state in some ways, you know, um, because Pakistan is, um, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing state in terms of like, you know, how, uh, how they could resolve these internal issues um, with with, with Balochistan, with Sin, with uh, uh, in, in um, Pakistan or Khyber Pakhtunwa, and in in place like Azad Kashmir, and it doesn't have to be this tense, you know. I mean, uh, and I so I just don't understand what is the impulse that makes Pakistan Pakistani state. Um, you know, actually fail to resolve these issues. Like, I, you know, in India, I can see that there is a um, an upper caste Hindu, you know, community who have to keep the India in this state of uh, tension, um, and that's why they have this specter of Muslim as the other. They have the they they need to otherize the Dalits. They need to otherize the Adivasis. To maintain their power, uh, you know, and that's why this Hindutva ideology exists uh, because it allows um, this this um, dominant this dominant group, which is not the majority but the dominant group, to retain its power. And uh, so it's easier to understand and easier to resolve in the sense that you know, if people came together, um, forgot these other differences, and kind of tried to make India democratic, truly democratic, which it is not democratic; it's never been democratic. Yeah. Made truly democratic, then I think some of these issues could be resolved. I think in Pakistan the problems are many, much more artificial. You know, almost like as if like the, there are like officials sitting somewhere who are like trying to poke people and trying to make them into problems. You know. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. No, I do. I'm. Uh, I mean, I was born and brought up in England, but I am like you know, my parents are originally from Pakistan, and my dad's a Pakistani journalist, so I get a lot of the, um, you know, the perspective from him and get a gist of what Pakistani society can be like. And I'm superficial is one word to uh, describe Pakistan's problems, but I, I mean, if it wasn't for this. Um, fact that we might be diverging from the conversation of it would definitely be an interesting conversation to go into. Uh, as to how Kashmiris probably fit into that, I can say probably that like the other ethnic minority groups that exist in Pakistan, um, you do have a Punjabi dominance uh, and within the Punjabi, uh, within Punjabis there is still a crisis exists as well. Uh, so the Pakistan is pretty much, um, you know, it's very Punjab oriented as well. So a lot of the the Bakhtuns and the Lochis and you have I mean Sindhis not as much, but probably to some extent as well. And then obviously the Kashmiris that you have in Delhi but as well and other ethnic minorities that exist. That that's one side of the politics and the friction that a lot of the representation is from there. Um so you don't really get that democracy happening in Pakistan and then also, the fact that it's not religiously homogenous. Um, I, I mean, on the forefront, it's like a Sunni Muslim country. 
But uh, again, Sunni Islam, Bredwis, Diobandis, all these kind of different types of religious groups and how they interpret Islam and how much of Sharia do you want in a secular Pakistan or not so secular Pakistan. A lot of those issues I think, arise and they sort of get translated into the Indian side, India as well, into like, you know, Indian secularism and then Hindu nationalism and all, you know, issues over a lot of nation with different labels can probably uh, relate to. Uh, we do have one more question. To what extent do you think the conflict has shaped Kashmiri identity and navigation in India and Pakistan? Well, yeah, I mean, um, it has. I started with saying that our identity has become political and I, I see mm -hmm. Kashmiri as a political identity um, because not as, uh, I, I, mean, I don't mean political as somehow pejorative or like, you know, somehow it's bad. Um, political because uh, when we are like caught up in these contesting claims, um, like India has absolutely no claim on Kashmir. Like, you know, they call themselves democratic country, but they rely on the this piece of paper signed by the worst autocrat in, in the region, the Dogra, last Dogra ruler, and not on the will of people of Kashmir. Um, and so it, it's hard not to be um, political. It's hard not to um, see yourself through this lens of India, Pakistan as well. Um, and to see ourselves as like caught between, in between uh, these two countries. Um, and I, I think the, the, I mean, um, of course, I would not want to equate India with Pakistan. I mean, India mm. towards Kashmir is of one of domination. Um, the Pakistani, um, you know, attitude towards Kashmir is one of sympathy, but also ignorance. You know, um, I am sometimes shocked by the commentary by even, you know, many of these liberal Pakistanis um, who somehow claim to speak on behalf of Kashmir, who don't, who are unwilling to understand the Kashmiri uh, history of Kashmir, our society, um, and. You know, I mean, I, 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 my sense was, for instance, that uh, when August 5, 2019 happened, many in the Pakistani establishment didn't know how to respond because they hadn't even considered some of these questions. There wasn't enough work, scholarship, uh, knowledge of what was happening in Kashmir, you know. Um, and and it's just, it's kind of tragic. I, I think that if Pakistani society had a better understanding of Kashmir, there will be much more alignment in our thinking. On the Indian side, India has invested a lot of work on trying to understand Kashmir. So they know, but they don't want to listen. You know, they just, they know, they're not ignorant about Kashmir. Um, they are, what they're doing is with full knowledge that they are in the wrong. You know, even their liberal commentators would not, um, they would not admit that they're wrong, even though they know that it's wrong. In private conversations, they would always say, "Yeah, if we 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 are we're doing terrible nonsense to you," but they can't. They don't say it in public. There's not much courage, sadly. Oh, well, sadly, oh, but it's interesting considering the conversations that you hear happening on TV. Um, well, I think thank you so much for your time. This is probably our longest chat we've had so far. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us and giving us that incredible insight. And I would like to thank our audience for watching. Our next episode is on Saturday at the same time where we'll be in a similar conversation with another academic, Dr. Naila Ali Khan. Um, I would like to thank you again on behalf of um, Identity International. And good, good evening. Thank you, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Ms. Bell. <laughs>